He was the he's the president of our uh, respiratory chapter. Sorry, I didn't introduce. Oh, that's Dr. fine. That's fine. And Dr. N K Subramanian is a uh, secretary. Sir. Hello, sir. I'm Dr. Subramanian. I'm professor in pediatrics. Uh, field of interest is pulmonary. I'm at Bangalore. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Jagdish Chinnappa is our president, working as secretary for uh, IAP respiratory chapter. Wonderful. Wonderful. So we are calling this. I was. I was just respiratory like basically. to say in in simple words to link nicely done mm. so um one of my uh, close friends in cincinnati vivek narendra okay uh he is in i think really okay is he over here at the children's hospital that's right sir he is at the children's hospital be interesting sometimes you know this large institute um okay. about 500 plus beds as a children's hospital um it's largely a sub specialty oriented i would like to say organization and a quaternary referral center not like we don't do primary care but i think they have evolved so much and i think when there is you know aggressive developments in the field certain institutes become much more at the front lines you know some of these institutes have de developed really to consolidate resources so that everything is focused in a single environment and then after that things um explode into other places So this is one way of kind of I feel pooling resources, whether it's intellectual funds, um, grants, all these things. So it certainly uh, a very unique institute that way. And I think it's been focused heavily on developing careers, developing, developing patients. Patients always come. at the forefront um and at the same time they keep an eye on making sure that the impact is not just local national and international absolutely so um the goal of you know when i joined here it was purely um tiny is how i would put it that brought me here and um you know sometimes we go through life and there's a domino effect of chain of events that puts you in a certain place at a certain time and you realize it's for and that's how it was with me and when i joined here we were not a very big division of pediatric pulmonologists we were about 12 of us and then over the past 15 12 years 13 years that i've been here it's really exploded and now we're about 28 of us wow. many of us many of them are much more protected in research um, but now what we have is the areas of sub specialty interests so there is a group that does purely bronchology and airway upper airway stuff there's a group that only does asthma group that only does cystic fibrosis there's a group that only does rare lung diseases the interstitial lung diseases and um other rare uh pulmonary parenchymal pathology and then that does lung transplant and then i share i do there's a few of us that do, do mostly neuromuscular pulmonary pathology but the three of us are also trained in sleep medicine so that becomes the perfect fit because you understand the respiratory control respiratory mechanics respiratory physiology and you pretty much are in charge of the entire ventilatory support for the patient whether it's invasive or non invasive interesting <clears throat> fantastic Wonderful i think the the participants are logging in and they are also viewing from the other channels okay. um, should we in now sure and then i think uh, they are they are all joining but still uh, i think we'll start with the with by the time the formalities end and i think our introduction and all sir most probably 
would uh, would be in okay so i think uh, you can start now from uh, clarinet okay so thank you so much okay so good evening and welcome all the doctors who have joined and digitally brought to you by clarinet so now i hand over the session to professor dr jagdish chinappa sorry professor dr subramania nk the honorary secretary of iup national respiratory chapter so please go ahead good evening my dear friends greetings and welcome from indian academy of pediatrics national respiratory chapter myself i am dr subramanya i am i am with me dr professor dr jagdish chinappa uh, who is the president of the chapter from both of us uh, warm greetings and welcome and it is nice to see that uh, fatigues that have happened in covid times are still interested and enthusiastic to learn and that's the spirit which drives uh, to arrange and organize webinar series which we call from our pulmonology as respinars so this is the ninth such one and we are going to have at least uh, full century 100 of them Uh, with all your blessings so that's some some kind of uh, or should i say dream for us what is also heartening to see is that we have uh, today uh, professor dr heman savnani he is born brought up in india studied in mumbai at the prestigious km hospital or i would say gset in uh, gs medical college and then went abroad and now he has uh, completely established himself and got recognized and is serving pediatric pulmonology in his area of interest uh, sleep and also in neuromuscular problems in children so that is his area of specialization he was talking to some of you uh, and uh, many of you must have been already informally introduced to him now Uh, today's session was is because of relentless efforts from our own pulmonologist younger brother of mine executive committee member of an academy pediatric respiratory chapter dr pavan kalyan he is also doing wonderful work uh, in india sir uh, dr heman ji so he is um, is a very good uh, um, pulmonologist who got trained abroad and then now he is back to us uh, to mother india so we, we so with these words Uh, i will request every one of you please join respiratory chapter join all the respinars feel free to interact i would also request dr heman savnani at the end of the day kindly send us an article of today's topic if at all you have so that we publish it in our journals or in our periodicals or in our newsletters and it will reach to those of them who could not join for various reasons today so it will reach out to everyone yes we would be very glad to have from you so that would be very nice for us so with these words i will request dr jagdish chinappa to give his opening remarks uh, dr jagdish um thank you anya and uh, welcome to all the participants who are in the uh, audience here uh, i think we have slowly realize the importance of sleep and yesterday we had a very long comprehensive program for the pediatrician to sensitize them to sleep issues and uh, dr pawan was one of the faculty in that uh, meeting so now i think as dr hemant was speaking to us a little time back india is at a nascent period of pulmonology and we are now just emerging into getting into more and more specialization and one of the major specialization is sleep and its attendant problems and uh, non invasive ventilation neuromuscular disease and its problems so i think we are getting one of the best in this field to talk to us dr hemant specializes in this and it will be a delight to hear his views on how they manage it it at cincinnati and then we can see how we progress in india so welcome sir welcome thank you very much for 
uh, coming here this evening and uh, enlightening us on this particular topic. Well, at the onset, I would like to thank you, Dr. Jagdish Napa. I will uh, request Dr. Pawan Kalyan to moderate the session. Uh, Heman sir, Dr. Pawan will give his uh, opening uh, remarks and introduce you and then you can start your presentation. Over to Dr. Pawan Kalyan. And lastly, we will have questions, sir. Questions will be typed in uh, question and answer box. If you are able, it's okay. Otherwise, we will ask all of them at the end. Sure. So there should not be any uh, anybody who will be disappointed with any unanswered questions. We'll see that every question will be taken up and uh, will be asked to you at the end of your presentation. I will hand it over to Dr. Pawan Kalyan to moderate the session. Well, Dr. Pawan Kalyan, please. Good evening uh, to Dr. Jagdish sir and Dr. NK and uh, my uh, colleagues who are in the delegates. It's a pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Hemant Sanani. It's a dream come true. I was at Cincinnati in the year 2015. Since I was trying to catch hold of Sir to give a talk to the Indian respirologists. We are, we are just at a nascent stage, as Dr. Jagdish Chinnapa said. And to start reading the introduction of Hemant would take not an hour, it would take a day. So let me give a brief introduction of Dr. Hemant and how lucky and how privileged to have Dr. Hemant to us. He has just his, did his undergraduation from Sage College in the year 1990. From there, he pursued his pediatric pulmonary, pediatrics, pediatric pulmonary, and pediatric sleep medicine from USA. He has been the associate professor in the division of and sleep medicine in Cincinnati Children's Hospital. It is, it is one of the top five hospitals in USA. And he is not only the associate professor, but he is the clinical director of neuromuscular pulmonary. Cincinnati Children's Hospital at Cincinnati. It's my honor and privilege if you have seen Sir working with the, when I was at Cincinnati to do my observership, I had a privilege of working with him for neuromuscular pathy, and they have a team. As Sir said, there was a couple of, now they have been subspecialized in subspecialty. Now, to his achievements, there are a number of achievements which if I enlist are many, but I will tell the few which are important. He has been awarded as a Dean of School of Medicine Award for an excellence in research and presentation by a resident fellow in the 14th Annual Chilean Medicines. And he has also received a travel award. For his clinical service, I would tell you, he has been seeing ne nearly about 1,000 neuromuscular kids and cardiomyopathy, or uh, you take any spinal problems. He has been uh, after those kids in and around the Cincinnati area, Ohio State. And not only that, he, for them, they have a long-term tracheostomy or long-term ventilation units, which is a 24 bed. The real complex cases have seen there would be a lot of discussion to handle such cases is very difficult. Those long-term ventilations would be ventilator dependent or tracheostomy. So he heads, he monitors those also. And to his acknowledgement, there are a number of peer-reviewed publications under his name. And he has been author of many uh, chapter, uh, chapters of neuromuscular uh, New chapters in various textbooks. Let me be frank enough to say he will make neuromuscular disease in sleep in a very, very simple manner and everybody will be fascinated. Thank you, Dr. Heyman, for accepting my invitation and giving and sharing your knowledge to our Indian pediatric pulmonologists and the people who are interested in pediatric pulmonology. Mike is yours, sir. Stage is yours, sir. Thank you. It's been um, a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Dr. Subramanian and Dr. Um, Chinappa. Um, you know, Pawan came to us, spent a little time in 2015. I think it was maybe about seven to 10 days after a course in bronchology. Um, he came to learn his flexible bronchoscopies from other than the father of pediatric bronchology, who is Dr. Wood, who actually just retired this past Friday. Um, he wanted to do the 40th bronchoscopy course, but you know, given the COVID issue, we may have to lay that to rest for now. So he retired a little ahead of schedule. So without much ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'd like for you to be able to tell me if you can do you yeah. see the PowerPoint? Yes, sir. You can see full screen. No problem. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
So I'm going to actually, uh, my agenda today is very simple. I want to, I take a very practical approach to what I do and to understand what I do and also to teach my patients and families about what I do. Um, and it's important that we educate our patients and families so they can see the value in coming to you for follow-ups, the necessity and the importance of follow-ups, and also um, to be active participants in their own care. So I'm going to, you know, I'm not so sure whether they're all pulmonary or non-pulmonary people as part of the audience. And so I wanted to take a very basic practical approach to explain simple pulmonary mechanics to non-pulmonologists. And I sometimes take the similar approach when some of my audience is much more neurology or non-pulmonary sleep physicians. I do want to talk a little bit about the spectrum of neuromuscular disease pathology and what really falls under that umbrella and specifically some uh, polysomnographic findings and the therapeutic approaches we would take to that. Um, so, you know, as it stands, we, we know that we are structured with um, 12 pairs of ribs that articulate in the back to um, a series of vertebral bodies that are lined one on top of each other to form this wonderful multi-jointed articulating structure called the chest wall or the rib cage. And the beauty of this structure is not for um, the shape that it offers us, but for the function that it really serves, right? So really we would not be able to breathe effectively the way we do if we didn't have a rib cage. So what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, when you take a normal breath and you have a little breath, the diaphragm contracts, gets shorter and excurs and, and moves downward. What happens is it creates a negative pressure in the chest, a negative intrapleural pressure, which draws air into the lungs and that is how we normally breathe. So as a result of that, you experience the pump handle movement of an anterior superior movement of the sternum and anterior chest wall, and also a lateral displacement of the chest wall or the rib cage. And these two occur in two different dimensions. One is anterior posterior, the other is lateral. And think about it, there was a vertical increase in thoracic measurements as well with the diaphragm moving down. And that's why you don't even wrinkle your shirt, you breathe in 500 mils of air in you know, a single breath, and the displacement of the chest wall occurs in all three dimensions. This is one very important concept that I need for you to understand, that we need three-dimensional excursion of the chest wall for normal breathing. Now, when we look at the functional integration of how all of this occurs, it's far more complex than this simplified diagram. So you have a cortex that initiates conscious respiration, particularly during the time where you are angry or you get excited, you breathe deeper. The times that you are not really consciously thinking about your breathing, the impulses are still originating from different parts of the brain, lower areas, not always the frontal area. And that then translates, goes to the, the brainstem, to the autonomic respiratory centers. Now, what occurs over there is very interesting. There is relief, normal, there is integration of the chest wall muscles. And as impulses go down the spinal cord, down to the intercostal muscles, there is involvement of the diaphragm through the phrenic nerve. Okay, and your abdominal muscles, intercostals, abdominal muscles also get integrated for, let's say, if you have to take a cough, if you want to take a sigh. But also the other important part is the upper airway muscles. You can hold your hand out in any particular direction, and the reason it's stable is because of constant feedback mechanisms between extensors, flexors, abductors, adductors at the shoulder. The same is true for whether you do that with your elbow or arm. Well, the same is true for the upper airway. So pharyngeal dilators and pharyngeal constrictors all are influenced by basic tone, tonal discharge from the brainstem. The other things that influence respiratory drive are your upper airway receptors, um, carotid bodies, 
and uh, for chemoreceptor sensitivity. You got stretch receptors and J receptors and irritant receptors through the airways, lower airways and the lung tissue. And certainly you've got um, intra uh, cranial receptors as well, paraventricular receptors. And all these integrate oxygen and um, capnometry inputs and influence the drive to breathe. So any imbalances in all of these areas as of a neuro neurologic hit can lead to sleep disorder breathing, okay? So what happens with muscle weakness? We know that given in a significant enough presence um, or amount, the respiratory muscle weakness will lead to respiratory insufficiency. Now, what makes it unique in children is that they have not yet grown fully um, their chest wall or their lung volumes. So it's different when you take, for example, an adult who has a spinal cord injury who has completely grown their chest wall. It's a very different consequence compared to a child who develops a muscle weakness early on in life under the age of two or three or develops other neurologic injury and has not yet had a chance to grow the chest wall. So what I've done is for simplicity, I've actually delineated changes to the lung tissue on one side and changes to the chest wall structure on the other side. And what we find is that we know that clinically that recurrent respiratory um, pathologies occur with respiratory muscle weakness. There's a rep repeated presence of atelectasis and are often viewed on image or X-ray as a recurrent pneumonia. Over time, there is some scarring that develops and that leads to changes in lung compliance or the change in the elasticity of the lung. Um, in addition, you have the development of chest wall deformities that occur because of reduced lung ex expansion. And I'm going to give you some examples of what drives some of that for improved clarity. As a result, even the chest wall comp compliance begins to change. That means now both the lung and the chest wall start behaving very stiffly. So that three-dimensional excursion that we talked about now becomes maybe a one-dimension, which means it's primarily the diaphragm that's going to do the work and you're not going to get much displacement of the chest wall. You have diseases like Duchenne's cardiomyopathies um, where you will have additional pulmonary congestion or even if you're looking at um, left heart failure syndromes, whenever these occur, there's increased pulmonary congestion, the lung compliance decreases and there's a greater propensity to experience or to witness atelectasis or repeated recurrent infections. And last but not least, you can get changes in ventilatory drive. For example, if you have a traumatic brain injury that subsequently leads to a neuro, neuromuscular pathology. And then all of these begin to play on each other once each one of them gets established to a certain degree um, and begins to play on each other. So this is a clinical, you know, this is one of our patients who had 18 months, four years, and at seven years of age, I kind of catalog their chest x-rays and put it together. But what I want you to see is a few things. One is you've got a certain degree of chest wall. You know, this is a child with SMA2, a weak SMA2, um, spinal muscular atrophy. And what you see is very nice open intercostal space. You've got a central spinal column and um, a reasonable retrocardiac space of air or a, a retrosternal or precordial airspace, which is appropriate. And as the child gets older, you're seeing growth, but you're seeing the spine begin to buckle until about seven years. So what you're seeing is a, a, a situation by which the child is growing by physically, but the lung volumes, you look at the chest wall height, is not really increasing that much. And as a result, you start seeing buckling of the spine. So clinically, what I see is I see children begin to experience significant spinal deformities in the presence of neuromuscular pathology between about five and seven years of age when they experience a period of growth. And again, shortly around the time before or during adolescence. Um, this is, you know, when you look at the spectrum as it, from a simplistic uh, point of view, David Grozal in, in the year 2000 had a, um, he's one of the prominent sleep physicians in the field. 
had written a review on neuromuscular disorders and respiration, and he categorized these pathologies in a very simple manner. And there's a beautiful table that he had in this uh, book, in this chapter, but he categorizes as muscular dystrophies, such as congenital muscular dystrophy or Duchenne muscular dystrophy. They're all fairly unique sub disease substrates. Then there are the metabolic and congenital myopathies, the kids with Pompe's disease, you know, other um, um, mitochondrial disorders. Then you have neuromuscular junction disorders. As rare as it may seem, we do see some myasthenic syndromes in pediatrics as well, some congenital myasthenics. Uh, and um, those are your classical neuromuscular junction disorders. Peripheral neuropathies like Charcot Marie Tooth are known to present with significant spinal issues. And then anterior horn cell disease, also known as SAA, spinal muscular atrophy. But the one part that people forget to think of is the acquired forms. So acute transverse myelitis syndromes, traumatic brain injury, shaken babies or you know, uh, non-accidental brain injuries, vehicular accidents, um, hypoxic ischemic injuries, whether they occur as part of perinatal hypoxia, all of those can be forms of neuromuscular pathology in the first few years of life as well. So, you know, in the adult sphere, the adults, I picked this right off the um, MDA website in Canada, and they have, they see a larger, a slightly different pathology um, space spectrum. And um, they also have far more other, you know, listed a variety of other additional disorders. Emery Dreyfus is one of those, facial scapular, uh, Friedrich's ata ataxia, GBS syndromes, limb girdle muscular dystrophies. These are the more common ones. And the ones in light gray are your uh, much rarer um, presentations. So Pompe's myositis uh, presentations, all of those can have um, neuromuscular presentations. Now, the important thing is your evaluation for these patients may suggest that these patients look well when they come to you and um, they are feeling at their best. But the moment you subject these patients to fever or stress, they become very catabolic. Once they become very catabolic, if they have limited respiratory reserve, they can't meet those catabolic needs. And as a result, they experience respiratory failure during those moments of time. So I always explain to my families and patients, any fever needs to be addressed very aggressively. And this is absolutely true for patients with um, mitochondrial disorders with an energy metabolic, um, energy state, metabol energy metabolisms uh, are deranged. So what are the physiologic observations we see, right? So your physiologic observation starts when you enter the room. So this young man, um, element sac is actually um, a different type of congenital muscular dystrophy, a Fukuyama type of congenital muscular dystrophy. And as you can see, he almost looks like he is walking out and looks like um, a very well-endowed muscular individual, but actually that's a severe amount of muscle weakness and contracture. These images in the center in black and white are of um, collagen 6 congenital muscular dystrophy. And these patients present with um, you know, elbow contractures. They can't straighten their elbows. They're usually toe walking at a younger age. And some of these patients actually are predisposed to developing keloids. Um, in younger kids, you can actually have very flat feet. Um, and some adults, the Bethlehem type, which is the mildest form of congenital muscular, of um, collagen 6 congenital muscular dystrophy, actually will present in this day and age with difficulty typing because they can't approximate those very you know, closely in when they bring their hands together. And because of the contractures between the interphalangeal joints, they have difficulty typing. This is a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and you can see the classic pseudo hypertrophy of the calf muscles, and then frog-like positioning of a child with a congenital myopathy, which in this case was SMA. This young girl also has um, a form of congenital muscular dystrophy, and she, um, this is a classic facies that we see and that is um, a merosin deficient um, congenital muscular dystrophy. Now, as you walk in, seeing the ambulatory status of these patients is important. Understanding what weaknesses they are experiencing is important. 
And then when you look at the respiratory pattern for these patients, it's really important to try and assess um, their tidal respiration. This is a video of one of my Duchenne boys. And surprisingly, look at the chest rise. It's at, right? So that's maximal breathing. And you can see entirely only abdominal breathing, not the classic thoracoabdominal respiration that we would be uh, accustomed to see. So what are the other physiologic observations we look at? We look at um, pulmonary functions. And so I just have a couple of slides. As a pulmonologist, we always have to talk about pulmonary functions, right? So when you look at lung volumes and capacities in these patients, what you're going to see is there's going to be a restriction of the floor and the ceiling of your vital capacity, right? So this diagram may be familiar to many one of you, many of you, but I'll just review it. So your vital capacity is made up of a combination of your tidal volume, which is what you breathe at rest. Anything above that inspiration is your inspiratory reserve volume, which is what you tap into when you decide to walk faster, run up a flight of steps. Um, and your ERV, which is what you do when you are exhaling, say after a forceful cough, and you have exhaled, you feel like all the way down to residual volume, which is your RV. So the combination of all of these is what you can physically engage in is your vital capacity. So very often, once these patients become wheelchair dependent, they are not able to exercise, they're not able to run, jump, play, which is really important for the development of chest wall structure and for developing maximal capacities. If you don't exercise a joint, it's going to get contracted. So if I cast your arm and I take it off after six weeks, but I've only given you limited mobility within the cast, you will only have a limited mobility after I take the cast off. So children who don't run, jump and play and don't experience the maximal range of motion of the vertebral joints um, or the cost of, or, um, at the sternal and the vertebral ends, are going to experience contractures over there. And as a result, we start seeing a reduction in the peaks of the IRV or ERVs. And that is how the vital capacity begins to get contracted in these patients. Scoliosis also adds to that, right? But you will see that the RV to TLC ratio will look a little larger. And that is because of the reduction in your vital capacity, even though the RV stays about the same. It's only at very severe states of contraction that the residual volume may appear reduced. The flow rates of these patients are also they begin to decrease. So when you do pulmonary function tests, you don't really appreciate a classic flow volume loop. And I'll explain that to you in the next slide because of muscle weakness. And if you ever see a change in vital capacity from upright to sitting position of more than 25%, this is adult data. It's indicative of diaphragmatic dysfunction until proven otherwise. So when I talk about the flow volume loop, what do I mean? Um, this is your typical, you know, in a flow volume loop from the machine perspective, this is the inspiratory, the expiratory portion of it. And that's your inspiratory portion. So in your peak flow, you would expect to see a peak flow that goes all the way and then comes down very, you know, smoothly and then takes a deep, smooth inhalation. So what you find is that your peak is going to be lower. Instead of being up higher, it's much lower. Also, it takes a little longer to come to your peak flow. It may not be a one second, FEV1 typically occurs. Um, so your peak flow should occur in the first one half of a second or so, but you may exceed it prolonged. The other interesting thing that you see is this flow, the inspiratory flow drops off very rapidly towards the end of inspiration. And then lastly, you may actually experience flattening of the inspiratory volume. And sometimes that may be due to weakness of the inspiratory, your uh, vocal cords, upper airway muscles during a maximal inspiratory effort. So this is one of our patients who actually has severe um, congenital muscular dystrophy or Rick's congenital muscular dystrophy. And what you see is that the FEV1 is certainly reduced at 34%. But so is the FVC. 
And I see a lot of patients referred to us where this is still called an obstructive pattern when your FEV1 to FEC ratio is still normal. So if both of them are restricted, if both of them are decreased, then that is definitely a restrictive pattern. Um, the peak expiry flow is also reduced because of muscle weakness. And then when you look at the maximal inspiratory and expiratory pressures, so it's important you also measure maximal inspiratory and expiratory pressures. Those are also severely reduced in this patient. Now, in his case, we also did lung volumes. And here's where I say that although his total lung capacity was at 54%, his residual volume was still 80% of normal, so not very reduced. And that is why the RV to TLC ratio appeared much late, much greater at 56% as opposed to 20, 20 to 25% of where it would be expected. And when you look at your flow volume loop, you can see how small and low that is, right? So another diagram that you may be familiar, familiar with, what happens during tidal breathing? We normally at FRC, which is between inspiration and expiration during tidal breath, have a negative pleural pressure of about minus four to minus five centimeters of water pressure. With contraction of chest wall muscles, mostly isometric, and then active contraction of the diaphragm, you begin to experience a more negative intrapleural pressure, which facilitates inspiration until the gradient between the alveolus and atmospheric pressure has been eliminated at the end of a normal tidal breath. And then the recoil of the chest wall kicks in at the end of that for a normal passive exhalation until the next cycle begins. What happens with chest wall muscle weakness is that your ability to maintain this negative pleural pressure decreases over time. So you experience diaphragmatic weakness, you experience intercostal and pectoral muscle weakness, strap wall muscle weakness, I mean strap muscle weakness. All of that makes it very difficult for the chest wall to have that typical recoil it used to have. And therefore, the alveolar forces of surface tension begin to have an aggregate more of a greater effect, a greater aggregate effect and you start experiencing lower lung volume states. When you experience lower lung volume states, eventually you hit a certain point at which surface tension increases to the point of atelectasis. And what the body does is it tends to sacrifice certain lung volume units so that it displaces air into other alveolar units to maintain reasonable amounts of surface tension in those lungs, in those lung units. That is really important in trying to reduce your work of breathing on a breath-to-breath -breath basis. So begin, atelectasis begins to set in as you have chest muscle weakness. Now, once you have muscle weakness, what happens when you go from a vertical to a recumbent position? In the vertical position, gravity still acted in a downward manner, and so the bowel contents fell off the diaphragm and tidal excursion was relatively unimpeded. What happens when you lay down is that gravity still acts in a, in a downward manner, but all the abdominal contents now push the diaphragm to a much higher resting position. As a result, lung volume decreases and tidal volumes begin to decrease, okay? So how important is tidal volume? Well, if you think about a, a typical tidal volume of 500 ml, 350 is what is available for alveolar ventilation because 150 goes to dead space. Dead space is all of the air that does not take part in air exchange. When that happens and you start experiencing lower tidal volumes, what occurs is a progressive reduction in your effective alveolar volume because the tidal volume, the dead space, will still take its pound of flesh from the, dead, from the tidal volume. And so, even though you may experience a 20 or even a 40% reduction in tidal volume, if your tidal volume went from 500 to 300, your net alveolar reduction went from 350 to 150, which is a 57%, almost 60% reduction. 
And this is really important to understand when you think of volume control modes for your patients and you forget to think about dead space ventilation in the circuit, in the hose, um, to the patient, in the mask, all of those things. So ventilation needs tidal, and when is the tidal volume appropriate? When you see enough of thoracoabdominal excursion. I tell people to stick with the number, look at the patient and see what is optimal for tidal volume. So I wanted to you know, highlight something very interesting. In um, This is a muscular dystrophy with myositis mouse model that looked at early dysfunctional diaphragm in this titanopathy model. So there is the wild type. At two weeks, you can't see the difference between the wild type and the muscular dystrophy model at all. But what happens at six weeks of age is that the MDM model, the muscular dystrophy model, has severe hind limb wasting, spine deformity, and is non-ambulatory largely, um, and certainly is also smaller. Now imagine this is for a horizontal animal, let alone what would happen in a vertical individual like a child or an, or an adult, right, with low lung volumes. So what they did was they did 3D micro CTs and um, what you can see is that two weeks on the left, you've got the wild type in the first column and then the second column has the MDM model. There's not that much of a difference between the two at two weeks of age, but you do see a smaller diaphragm and slight change in the di um, diaphragm configuration beginning to set in. But at six weeks, you are seeing far more established thoracic dystrophy over here. Now let's take a second for to think about, um, you know, I actually usually carry a syringe with me when I'm in clinic, just so I can explain a point to families. If you consider the chest wall to be the syringe, the plunger of the syringe is going to be your diaphragm. So any excursion of this chest wall, of this diaphragm, is going to lead to inflow or, or expiratory flow in the syringe. Everything is good as long as you have a, a wall that is rigid. If this syringe was made of plastic, thinner plastic or um, paper, and I tried to pull this plunger down, this whole thing would implode. And the reason is because it, there's not enough structural rigidity to hold this up in the presence of a negative pressure. Now, if you think about it, patients who have muscle weakness have weaker bones. So as a result, they are more likely to experience bone malformation because of disuse atrophy of muscles or lack of muscular action on a bone. Let's go back to what we talked about casting your arm. If I put your arm in a cast and took an x-ray six weeks later, it will, in the absence of bone, in, of a fracture, you will experience marked difference in bone density between the right and the left arm because the left arm bone density stayed normal because you continue to use it and had muscles acting on the bone. If I casted this arm, not only would the bone density decrease, but you would probably have more weakness from not using the muscles for that period of time. So muscles really influence bone shape, bone form, bone density. And the same is true for the ribs. And that's how you get a lot of chest wall deformity, particularly in kids with SMA1 or, you know, other myopathies. Now, if you think about this, the chest now has significant asymmetry at six weeks of age in the animal model. We know from clinical experience that people with muscle weakness start becoming shallower and faster in their breathing. So that means your respiratory cycle time decreases, which means air is going to flow to the areas of least resistance or most compliance. So what's going to happen in this animal model is in every single breath, airflow is going to occur primarily to the left hemithorax more than the right hemithorax because it takes more energy to deform and inflate the right lung against a right hemithorax, which is 
deformed. And as a result, that spine deformity and rib deformity, once it has set in, it will accelerate because of almost unilateral lung use as opposed to bilateral. Is that clear? The other part that I also want to explain, what happens to the diaphragm is this. If this is your normal diaphragm and it moves through a full range of motion, up to down, when you have scoliosis, you have rotation of the vertebral bodies. That's what scoliosis is. It's not the curve, just a left to right curve. It's actual rotation of the vertebral bodies. That's why you see a hemithorax becomes more prominent in the back and, big, and diametrically opposite becomes flat. And that's because of rotation of the ribs. And the similar thing is occurring this last image on the lower right corner where you are seeing a rotational deformity over here. So what's happened is your diaphragm, which used to be this, is now like this. So it can't function effectively. So if you have a dysfunctional diaphragm on that hemithorax, it's going to reduce tidal volume to that side. It's going to reduce your net deflection and negative pleural pressure. It's also going to reduce your cough efficiency. You can't take a deep enough breath in order to cough it out. Okay? And that is why we also see stasis of secretions and um, over um, uh, encumbrance of secretions in these patients. Well, we covered this already. Just... So what happens if you get reduced lung volumes? When you have a low tidal volume, you start experiencing hypoventilation because when you breathe, we do two things. You breathe in, you oxygenate, you breathe out, you ventilate. You get rid of the stale air when you ventilate, right? You go home after you've been away for a month, you open up the windows because you want to air out the house. You want to get rid of the stale air. So you are ventilating the house. So whenever you have low lung volumes, you're likely to experience hypoventilation. In addition, air diseases mucus, and if you don't have enough airflow, you're going to have impeded airway clearance. And that is where you will also get increased work of breathing from atelectasis and collapse. Now, those of you will remember that you will also experience lower alveolar volumes. There's a law in physics and physiology also called Laplace's law, that the surface tension of the alveolus is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So the moment your radius begins to decrease, the surface tension begins to increase very rapidly until that lung unit collapses. That also leads to increased work of breathing. Last but not the least, the previous images in the animal model give you an idea of the thoracic deformities that can come up. So what is the use of polysomnography in patients with neuromuscular disease? It's been very well established that respiratory muscle weakness does lead to sleep water breathing, which means disruption of ventilation and oxygenation and sleep architecture in sleep. And this leads to daytime symptoms, often very early on. And these patients can present actually with frequent nocturnal um, awakenings and insomnia. So parents may say he doesn't sleep, but that's the body saying, wake up, breathe, wake up, breathe repeatedly through the night. Polysomnography is really important in diagnosing or detecting sleep disorder breathing early in these patients. And therefore, it, it allows the early initiation of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or bilevel pressure ventilation for these patients. And this has been clearly shown to improve quality of life, longevity, and survival in these patients. Um, you know, there was... This is taken out of one of the sleep medicine books. This is actually an adult who had presented with um, uh, hypo with um, headaches and insomnia, and this had an underlying diagnosis of early um, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And what you see here in the classic polysomnography is there are eye move eye leads over here. 
there are a few limited EEGs. There's the chin EMG, EKG, or ECG with a heart rate monitor. There's a snore channel. There's a nasal pressure transducer. There's an active thermocouple that de detects airflow at the nose. Chest and abdominal belts, or what we call impedance plethysmography. A pulse oximeter, and then they use two channels of carbon dioxide, which is end tidal as well as transcutaneous. So in some in uh, in this case, it's one channel with just the end tidal signal over here, the PCO2 waveform. But we can also use transcutaneous, and I'll show you some epochs um, in that regard. And what you see here is saturations that maybe dip a little bit to the 95 range, but again back up to 98. And this is what happens. What happened is the CO2 was in the 50s and somebody put this patient on oxygen and you can see right away how the carbon dioxide climbs into the 90s with the use of supplemental oxygen. That was the point I wanted to make on this is that supplemental oxygen is not the treatment for respiratory muscle weakness. So what happens, you know, as we know that our sleep is comprised of dream sleep and non-dream sleep or REM sleep and non-REM sleep. So what happens during non-REM sleep? It's often the easiest to discuss. We see phasic diaph diaphragmatic EMG, um, intercostal and genioglossus in the tongue. Activity decreases with sleep onset. And then it increases a little bit during stage two, stage three of sleep, but not that much. There is a phasic tonic uh, phasic and tonic reduction of the oropharyngeal muscles, the tensor palati um, tone decreases, so pharyngeal volume decreases, and there's a slight increase in PCO2 with sleep onset. And there may be the combined effect of this reduction of the pharyngeal muscle tone can actually increase your upper airway resistance during sleep onset, and again later in slow wave sleep. Now, what happens in REM sleep is even more interesting. You have complete muscle atonia during REM sleep, except for the ocular muscles and diaphragm muscles. And as a result, because of that, you have a further reduction in your tidal volume, your minute ventilation, and your inspiratory flow. And so if you're going to see sleep disorder breathing, you're going to exceed it much more during dream sleep in these patients. And that's why many of these patients don't really dream. And when you put them on support, they get dream rebound and they'll come back and tell of all the dreams that they experienced. And what we see is a smaller reduction in tidal volume, a higher frequency of respiration, um, but still have a lower minute ventilation. And there's a nice study that was done in normal adults that looks at different stages of sleep. This is wake stage two of non-REM and stage three or four or what we call slow wave sleep of non-REM. And then there's REM sleep. They broke up the REM sleep again into tonic and phasic REM. And what you're seeing is that broadly, as far as minute ventilation is concerned, we know that minute ventilation drops with sleep onset. The largest drop of, you know, it drops, but it stays fairly stable during non-REM sleep. Um, during REM sleep, the tidal volume decreases and the respiratory rate increases. And this is seen mostly during phasic sleep, phasic REM sleep, these dramatic changes. And I'm gonna show you some epochs in sleep to actually show that. So when we talk about sleep architecture, because sleep is broken up because of repeated awakenings at night, these patients tend to come to you with some semblance of sleep deprivation. So there is reduced sleep time because much time is spent awake at night and therefore the sleep efficiency as a percentage is decreased. There's increased sleep fragmentation and our sense is that this is much more um, adaptive because it's the body telling them to spend less time during dream sleep and more time either awake or light sleep, which tends to be life preserving because they don't, the body is very heavily stressed when you um, subjected to repeated apneas and hypopneas during sleep. That is REM-related hypoventilation and desaturation. And later that spills over into non-REM sleep and finally it spills over into awake as well. You see paradoxical respiration without narrowing of the upper airway. And this is a really important finding when we look at sleep studies in these patients. 
So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm trying to describe what is called a central hypopnea. Central hypopneas are um, reductions in effort with reductions in airflow. So you get marked reduction in tidal volume. You often see this during dream sleep. And the degree of desaturation that you see is likely related to the degree of diaphragm weakness. Why? Because if you're experiencing most of these during REM sleep and you're desaturating more, you have to think that if the diaphragm was the primarily rest muscle of respiration during REM sleep, and I'm still experiencing hypoventilation or hypoxia, that tells me that the diaphragm is fairly affected during REM sleep. And so this is, schematically, this is what it would look like. You'd see chest wall and abdominal excursion, and then they'll flatten out. Then again, they will increase, again, they will flatten out. And so it takes a cyclic pattern, and, that, and I'll show you a couple of epochs of how that looks like. What about oxygenation? So you can get high desaturations of sleep due to hypoventilation. That means the CO2 goes up. And this is very basic simple math, the application of the alveolar gas equation. You can get repeated apneas and hypopneas, which is um, reduction in the upper airway opening. And then you get VQ mismatch if there's atelectasis that is occurring as a result of reduced chest muscle um, tone. Most profound destabilization of saturations in oximetry occurs during um, REM sleep. So are there any clinical predictors? If you were to ask your patients, there's a lot of text on this slide. And I assure you, this is one of the few, we are, we're coming to a point where I think I'm going to run out of slides with text and the rest of the slides are going to be images because it's late enough for you. You don't need that much reading material. But I essentially summarized the study that came out of Stanford, one of the earliest studies for where they took a mixed bag of patients with neuromuscular disorders. There was adults, there were pediatric patients, there were males, females, and a variety of diseases. And as you see, they could not find anything conclusive to say that so-and-so has, this is, these symptoms are specifically predictive of sleep disorder breathing. So what's the role of pulmonary functions as you as a clinician, right? Um, this is study, this data came out of Australia, looking at an older subset of Duchenne boys on young men of 19 boys. And what they found was that an FEV1 of basically 40% um, FEV1, a PCO2 of greater than 45 millimeters of mercury, and a base excess of four are very sensitive indicators for sleep disorder breathing. Um, an FEV1 less than 20% correlated very strongly with daytime hypoventilation. So these are the two things that you could probably remember. And maximal inspiratory and expiratory pressures and total lung capacities don't really give you a good idea of the presence or absence of sleep disorder breathing. So this is the same paper. Uh, this is another paper published shortly around that time. And they looked at supine vital capacities. And what I is, just want to show you is that patients, as their lung function decreases, what I want to share with you is that initially they will experience hypopneas, which is reduction in the caliber of the airway with some desaturations in sleep, or have an arousal, that means sleep disruption. Then they continue to have that, they experience REM sleep-related hypoventilation, Later on, it is continuous hypoventilation, and finally, it's respiratory failure, where they're, they remain hypercapnic continuously with vital capacities of 25% or 40%, depending on where they are. Now, remind you, mind you, this is supine vital capacity. I wish I could do supine lung functions here, but I can't. This is a study that we did some years ago at our center, and we had 110 boys, younger, and these were all steroid-treated, glucocorticoid-treated boys. Their lung function was about 79.5%. And you can see they're not obese, but they're a little heading towards overweight. And what we saw was that these patients experienced a great degree, almost 64% of patients experienced obstructive sleep apnea, and the few that experienced 
central sleep apnea. The central sleep apnea here was obstructive with central sleep apnea. And a very small percentage experience pure hypoventilation, which is something you see in very established disease. But 17% of patients is a fairly decent amount to experience hypoventilation at such an early age. And what we found was there was a fairly linear correlation between the degree of sleep disorder breathing or the degree of obstructive apnea, the obstructive index, with their BMI. So if you have a BMI of greater than 24, in your patients who are steroid treated with Duchenne, even if they are 12 or 13 years of age, I would think that they need a screening sleep study because that is likely going to yield a diagnosis of sleep apnea that is worse during REM sleep. And so that's the other thing that we find is that when looking at the obstructive index, it can be fairly severe during REM sleep in these patients. So, Coming back to this diagnosis, this adult, so looking for tachypnea, particularly in the recumbent position, hypoxia, and hypercapnia. So the definition of hypoventilation or hypercapnia has been a bit of a, an issue in the sleep population. And we have, we are in the process now um, with different colleagues across the world working on defining what hypoventilation should look like when it comes to neuromuscular disease. Because by the time patients frank hypoventilation in sleep, the disease is so established and sleep disorder breathing is so well established in these patients. Then this is what happens when, this is the same slide I showed you earlier when he was put on supplemental oxygen and you can see the CO2 increase from the 50s right into the 90s on end tidal CO2. So this is a study over here, an epoch. this is the one minute epoch, this line in the center is the second mark um, of an individual. He was a teenage boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy during a REM sleep. So here in blue, you've got oculogram. This shows you the rapid eye movements that are occurring during phasic REM sleep. And this here, you're not seeing it. So this is what we would call tonic REM sleep. And here you can see the thoracoabdominal excursion decreases, and you're seeing a loss in airflow. And this is this is how a respiratory event is identified. The saturations are 100 percent. You're seeing some disruption in your carbon dioxide level, and it actually decreases because you're having decreased airflow. If your airway caliber decreases and it's impacting ventilation, you may actually have a decrease in your end tidal CO2. And when respiration resumes, it'll bounce back up. And the patient is a little tachypnea. So it's important that we familiarize our, our, have reasonable expectations of what the respiratory rate should be for individuals of a certain age. This is another epoch, and you can see an obstructive hypopnea, which is partial reduction in airflow, or a much more significant reduction in airflow where it's obliterated completely. That again occurs during REM sleep, as you can see. Um, they tend to have more significant phenomena there. Again, a tachypneic patient. Here again, you will see this is someone who's breathing 30 times a minute, is experiencing REM sleep, lots of REM rapid eye movements, I mean. And even though the oxygen levels are fine and the carbon dioxide levels are fine. For someone to breathe 30 times a minute to maintain normal carbon dioxide level is not normal, especially if they're a teenager. So I always try and look for that. It's important that we try and look for, you know, when you hear, there's a saying, you hear hoof beats, think of horses, but sometimes you have to think of zebras. So this is actually, I wanted to, it's not a very clear slide because of just how I think we saved it. Um, but you're seeing a reduction in airflow amplitude. You see some respiratory paradox, not too much, and then it resumes over here. Now, I didn't mark an arousal over here, but this is again, this is now a 90 second epoch. This is 30 seconds, this is 30 seconds, this is 30. Look and see when I zoom out now to like five minutes, three minutes, and you can see 
see this phasic crescendo decrescendo pattern of respiration almost looks periodic breathing this is again what we call central hypopneas where i said central versus obstructive hypopneas obstructive hypopneas won't occur in a similar sequential manner this is central hypopnea and you can sometimes see this with heart failure as well in uh, patients with ca significant cardiomyopathy this is a patient with um, sma1 who came for a later a bipap titration and you can see while awake the patient is tachypneic with a respiration rate of 52 a minute. That's the capnometry. Now it's important that we all have a plateau for our capnometry. This is a very poor signal. And that's why the end tidal capnometry looks like it's in the 30s, but the transcutaneous CO2 looks like it is in the 50s. So this is where the importance of having good quality signals are important in interpreting a sleep study. And once the patient has been situated on full vent support, you can make out, you have a good signal of flow, by levels, there's a lot, the par respiratory paradox that you had earlier is gone. And the patient is completely dependent on the ventilator support, which is set at 24 over five centimeters of water pressure and a full backup rate, which is age appropriate. You can see while awake, you see intercostal activity from the ex exertion of this patient, but you don't see any of that while awake. And that's a sign that your patient is adequately supported. Over here, you're seeing a little snore channel come, and that is actually because the leak from the mask increased momentarily, and it can look like a leak, um, can look like snoring. And if you have a big enough leak, you can actually lose breath and precipitate respiratory events. So doing these studies, comes with the responsibility of educating families on how to fit the mask and make sure that they have a good fit. So why bi-level pressures and not continuous positive airway pressure? So if you, schematically, if you look at our current respiratory pattern, we have a nice sinusoidal pattern. We know that individuals with respiratory weakness experience shallower breaths and faster breathing. So what bi-level pressures do is the lower pressure or the EPAP helps maintain a patent airway. Let me back up. If someone is going to experience a respiratory event after a normal breath, it is going to occur when the inhalation is done and it's at the end of exhalation. During that time, the airway caliber is decreasing and when they want to take a breath in and the airway has not opened up, that's where you experience obstructive hypopnea. So when you give an expiratory positive airway pressure or an EPAP, it stands the airway pneumatically. So if this was a non-neuromuscular individual, CPAP would act like a pneumatic stent and stent open the airway and allow it to breathe through. But what we do need to do is enhance the size of this breath or augment the inspiration. And that's why we need secondary level that will cycle off and allow the patient to inhale, to exhale. Then again, it will arrive and give them a tidal breath. When you support the patient with an optimal tidal volume, the patient will decide to stop breathing effectively and they will become largely dependent on the ventilator during sleep. That is reasonable and it's expected because you want to provide respiratory muscle rest and that is how their daytime function improves because they're not working hard in sleep and they're not working hard awake. They're better rested during sleep so that they can function normally while awake. Okay. So bi-level pressures are really important in supporting ventilation along with a backup rate. You cannot do it without all three need to be a part, an EPAP, an IPAP, and a rate with a designated eye time. So when you look at this progress through the night, we titrate pressures on patients. Your EPAP is driven primarily to treat obstructive apneas. And as the night progresses, you will increase your IPAP for hypopneas or related arousals and then any residual snoring. And during early morning hour hours, they may experience some REM sleep rebound and have some more 
um, apneas, and you may need to go back up on your EPAP by another one or two centimeters of water pressure. But by and large, the last thing to be eliminated in these patients is a phenomenon of what we call flow limitation, where they just need to have a better waveform after you've eliminated events. So you prevent overcorrection or over titration of these patients. So the role of adequate pressure support is really key. If you want these patients to do well, you know, the, I kind of got these images from the polio days back in the United States where they actually had rooms that were built as negative pressure ventilators. And this is how patients shared a single ventilator chamber. And they all were on the same pressures at the same time, with only the necks sticking out. And then the nurse would attend to them. These are individual patients, much like how we would have in our wards, in their individual iron lungs, as they would call them in those days. This is a negative pressure ventilator, ventilator that is, you know, there's only one company that makes this and um, they have a monopoly. I have not used it. We've tried it a few times without much good success. And then you have a variety of positive airway pressure devices, depending on the company or the brand that you have, whether it's Respironics, it's Philips Respironics or ResMed, any of these equipment. So positive pressure has a role. This is a child who has BPD, has a tracheostomy, as you can see, and you can see fairly good lung volumes. And more importantly, you can see a horizontal apposition of the ribs in relation to the vertical axis of the spine. You start seeing, a this is a child with SMA1, and you can see now there's no muscle at all in the chest wall or in the arms, all fat. You see a beginning of a decline, as I would say, or or de-inclination of the ribs in relation to the vertebral, vertebral axis. And also these ribs look extremely osteopenic or gracile is the word. Like you can, some of these ribs you can barely see. This is the patient progressing, they get older with a reduction in the anterior lateral diameters um, of the chest wall and you start seeing imploding of the anterior lateral spaces. And so what happens, they look like they have pectus carinatum when actually you've got retraction of the anterior lateral chest wall. And then the same patient progresses further to have complete collapse of you know, one lung. On the other hand, this is an infant with the same, and you can see there's no chest wall muscle at all. Here is an infant who is a child who was actually um, received a tracheostomy and ventilator in infancy in the nursery with um, uh, SMA1, and the child was never admitted. You can see the, the ribs are still very gracile, but and there is still scoliosis because of growth, but the rib deformities that I showed you earlier are non-existent, right? So what you're seeing is the effect of pressurization when you optimally support patients. Now I'm gonna give you another example. This is a little girl of mine. She came to us with congenital myopathy at about um, eight, six months of age, just with a tracheostomy. And the nursery where she was in just said, go home and take care of her. She came lethargic and her CO2 when she got admitted was about 75. We put her on a ventilator. Two months later, she went home. I got a CT on her before she went home. And this is her chest wall. You can see her AP diameter is greater than her lateral diameter. But at three years, she has a completely normal configuration of the chest wall because she was pressurized optimally. We see children who are born with one lung, normal chest wall structure otherwise, no muscle weakness, but they still develop scoliosis to the side where there is no movement because there's no lung. That tells you the lung has, plays a very big role in deciding the shape of the chest wall. And if we don't pressurize these children appropriately, they are going to experience severe chest wall dystrophy or dysmorphism, which is going to be associated with a great degree of morbidity and mortality. 
children who are who have large adenoids or tonsils will develop adenoid facies. That tells you that airflow is really important in developing the maxilla and frontal bones. And if you don't have good normal airflow, you're not going to develop good bone structure. So all I want to say is that in patients with muscle weakness, where chest wall structures are weaker, the ribs are softer and weaker, and the, um, the drive to breathe may be in suboptimal with muscle weakness of the upper airway, pressurize them appropriately with the hope that, you know, patients like this, if, if she has a cure coming up, she could potentially come off the ventilator if she had enough of chest walls, a normal uh, shape. With good form comes good function. And I'll end there. Thank you, Raymond. It was a wonderful and an elaborate too, and an easy, simple lecture, which made neuromuscular stasis as simple as what we have not known. Because I've experienced working with you, I was there in Cincinnati in 2015 for a month's time. And because of Dr. Bob Wood, I got a fellowship in Australia. I took a letter of recommendation from him. It's uh, So it was so nice that uh, you have made the topic so simple. So if you stop sharing, I would just ask a couple of questions who have been... Yeah, I'm trying to actually get out of that. Oh, wait, right here. Go ahead. Now, uh, there's uh, one of the interesting questions because he is Dr. Victor from... He worked in Kosh with the neuromuscular team. So he's asking, is there any effect of drugs on respiratory sensitivity in neuromuscular disordered child? Sir, um, Pavan, Pavan, with your permission, can I allow the victor in? Yeah, yeah, definitely, sir. Please, please. it'll be good to get some clarification. Dr. Victor, you can come in. Yeah, I think, uh, sir, uh, Heman, sir, you continue. I can have a sip of water. No, relax. Anyway. Sir, you can so continue. It depends on... Um, so, I have a patient who has congenital myasthenic syndrome. Um, and she was she years of age with the tracheostomy ventilator getting worse and they wanted to know for end of life if there was anything they could do. And I said, what's the diagnosis? And nobody knew. So one of my neurologists in, came out of the room in 10 minutes, literally jumping like a child. And he made the diagnosis of congenital neuromyasthenic syndrome in 10 minutes. We started the child on, on and she was off ventilator support for the day within a week. So to answer the question, I think the right diagnosis with the right, yes, there is an option to always do some good work there. But the broader question is, um, if you have some muscle structure will respond to treatment, I think that is going to be the bare minimum requirement um, for a drug to take its effect and for you to see a measurable benefit. Okay. So, so any anybody in the audience who wants to ask the questions live, you can raise your hands. I can see and promote you into the panel. You can directly interact with Victor. Victor has raised his hand. Victor, please please uh, speak now if you have any. Heman, there is one more one comment that uh, yeah. there's a uh, uh, from not a patient, is a doc, uh, Dr. Omi Narayan has commented that he's an uh, sleep specialist in UK. He listened to your lecture and said, you made the lecture so easy and <laughs> to understand. Pleasure. Thank you. Victor. Dr. Subodh Gupta, you can ask your question. Uh, good, good evening, sir. Please. Uh, no, about the calpinopathy, these patients, uh, how do they behave as far as respiratory physiology is concerned? Do they have the same uh, disasters as we have in uh, Duchenne type of, or the, they behave differently? What is your experience about calpinopathy? Calcinopathies? Calpinopathy. Calpinopathy, a variant of muscular dystrophy, congenital muscular dystrophy. I'm not familiar with that specific um, congenital muscular dystrophy. 
But if it's a, one of the four, um, when you think about congenital muscular dystrophy, the thing that is unique from Duchenne so that is um, these patients tend to have a greater degree of contractures than Duchenne patients early on in life. Um, and that's very true for like the, the um, especially the Merosin deficient ones, the Fukuyamas, the Sepin one um, congenital muscular dystrophies, the collagen six congenital muscular dystrophies, both as well as the intermediate forms. So all of those tend to develop very significant contractures. So um, if this big, if this form of muscular dystrophy is so similar to one of those. Um, dystroglyphicon of these, then yes, they are likely to develop the same um, degree of contracture. And this contracture in chest wall as well as um, skeletal, you know, um, axial skeletons. The other thing is what's unique is that these patients can present with alveolar hypertension when they're still hypo, when they're still ambulatory, which again is unique for um, some of these congenital muscular dystrophies, especially the sepin one, uh, uh, sorry, especially the merosin deficient and the um, collagen sixes. So this particular one that you mentioned, I'm not so sure if it's strongly in that, but I say, if you don't see good chest wall mobility while awake, it's definitely going to be even less so while asleep. Okay, thank you. Sir, I have got a question. Like, uh, let's say a preterm is there and a term is there, and an older child is there, an adult and a geriatric is there. Now, how you would like to visualize the breathing of physiology through the ages? And you know, what can be done to explore the complete potential? I'm, I'm taking you from preterm. Maybe you can go up to in utero to the final death. So please, so, uh, in something your part, about physiology, it's ultimately physiology that matters for us when we apply. So I would say that the first few years, even in utero, as well as subsequently up to age of about five to seven, the role of chest wall muscle strength is extremely important in the shape, development of the shape of the we have seen some patients with significant thoracic dystrophy born with thoracic dystrophy um, with some unknown myopathies in the back. Till today, we don't have a diagnosis. And they do tend to have severe respiratory failure as the result of that. If you look at a child who was born normally, normal shaped and develops acute weakness later, either because of myelitis or um, spinal cord injury or a head injury somewhere, then I would say that the type of underlying neuropathy determines what's going to happen. So children with spastic forms of cerebral palsy become so stiff that the chest doesn't move. They have a very, they clearly have a very severe form of restriction um, to respiration. Patients who are in, you know, electrical status because of severe or whatever. Conversely, the patients are very hypotonic, lose chest wall, wall compliance very quickly, become hyper compliant for a moment, then become very tight in the chest later. It's almost like having a rigid cage on the chest wall. And patients who go through that period where they become hyper compliant and then lose compliance because of a delay in intervention are at greater risk of having respiratory failure. Those where you intervene can be managed with very low settings even as they get older. The differences from a physiologic perspective are complex because the interplay between intercostal muscles and diaphragm, and the upper airway. What I found is that as you have more upper airway weakness, your risk of having deformity of the chest wall increases very quickly because they continue to try and inhale against the closed glottis. And you can try and do that 
like create a pseudo obstruction for yourself and try and inhale. And you can really feel a very negative intrathoracic pressure being developed. And that's you who don't have muscle weakness. So in these individuals, when they're younger, the combination with a weaker rib cage is going to yield far more thoracic dystrophy. Now, when you look at an older individual, anything past the age of like 16, 15, 12, even in, into adulthood, we do see the role of the chest wall formation becomes less significant. And any pathology over there is going to be driven almost exclusively by upper airway instability and muscle weakness. The form of the chest wall has already been established. And so, like, if you have somebody who is 30 years old and has a spinal cord injury, it's going to develop significant spinal deformity in the next 10 years or so because they've already fully grown. But what changes, depending on what age group you have after that, is pretty dry. And as we age into adulthood, late adulthood, we're talking about 40s, 60s, the, you know, geriatric population, Weakness of the upper airway, weakness of the trunk muscles is the norm, okay? So understanding the process of aging and how we breathe is really important. And we see this in our own parents, that they gradually begin to sit slumped like this. Yeah. And so even, even eating normally for them actually is the equivalent of if I eat this with my neck a little extended, but if I change my position, that same position now is actually almost eating hyperextended. So the neck position, so many older people will choke on their food. Yes. And that is because of how they sit and they're trying to eat by still meeting the folks across the table. Yeah. So it's important to educate them that they should sit better supported and keep the chin down when they eat. Because airway protection is a real big part of gaining good pulmonary health. And aspiration is a big problem for people there. Sir, that tempts me to the next question, Pawan, sorry. A couple of two continuity questions I wanted to ask. Sure. Please tell us, uh, what is the normal breathing rate, which we call as respiratory rate? And what I'm going to ask you now is, normal let's say definition of tachypnea is not important to me let's say below that what the normal range means i i will say yeah. for example the range is 20 to uh, i mean 20 to 30 in a given age what the so, 30 means and what that 20 means is that child at at 20 better or is that child 29 so, better i think i'm get just dissecting some something more of physiology let me rephrase your question Okay. okay. If I were to say you have a tidal ventilation, which is your tidal volume multiplied by your rate of a certain amount. So let's say somebody has a minute ventilation of six liters, that they're breathing 100 mils 12 times a minute. Correct. Okay. If I were to change that to the point that someone's breathing 100 mils 60 times a minute, the logic. Now it okay. may be okay for a an infant or, you know, into toddler, but it's certainly not normal for anybody past a certain age. So we, what I say is, I expect a normal age range of children that's age appropriate, let's say an infant can anywhere be 60 a minute. But after the age of two, after the age of three, I usually feel that the rates are in the upper 20s to low 30s after the age of one, from 28 to 32, 35 would be okay. You can only go by what seems like a normal range. The moment you hit early child, the tolerances decrease. And we say people need to be in the range of about, you know, by the time they hit adolescence, I would expect people to have a range of 12 to 60. So younger children between five and eight or five and 10, I would put in a range of you know, an upper limit of 20 to 24. So if I see a six breathing 30 times a minute, to me, that's pathological. Yeah. Right. So that's interpreting what we are seeing needs to be in the context of the diagnosis. Sir, 
why i asked this question was because suppose let us define the tachypnea by a minus 10 then we going we may have some false positives of diagnosis of tachypnea right. all right so but, just, but will will that reduce the mortality my question is simple by by just defining it by Than ten, if we can improve the death rate, I mean, if we can prevent some people from dying, will it make sense? I can tell you what. Just to the first part of it, we've chosen and we're trialing this, not looking at a rate of X amount, but looking at a rate of twenty five percent or over from what is expected at baseline. That is seems to be. So if I see someone who has an expected rate of about twenty to twenty four a minute. But they're breathing 30 a minute. That's a 25% change. Then I would say that's abnormal. Now to the second part of your question, my answer would be yes, particularly if it's a progressive disease, because yeah. you know that what you're seeing is only going to get worse, and you know that if you don't treat him now, there's a chance he's going to land up in the hospital more acutely sick. The problem is that when patients are acutely sick, they lose function. And so, by the time they recover from that illness and get home, they may never be at that right baseline. So, treating them in a timely manner, not to can't do it when they don't have pathology, but as they are evolving, my answer is yes. If you treat, you're likely to gain much more function longer period of time. Second thing is you are preventing unnecessary hospitalization, which in the longer run is cheaper. Cheaper. Third. They are healthier. Their quality of life is better, right? Fourth, it is less stressful on the parents and the family to not have fluctuations in health, from being well to be be sick, be sick. And lastly, if you know what to expect, you can. When you start around this age, before they are, there, they have a little more time to adjust. And participate in their care, sir. I'm, 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 my apologies for continuing that question. Extrapolation of the same. Yeah. We have a lot of malnourished children in India. Yes. So therefore, I would assume that the thoracic cage, the muscles, everything must be definitely, uh, you know, much less efficient compared to their normal, normally nourished counterparts. Yeah. So. How best you think that you no, know, even in defining tachypnea, we've given a margin of five. Is that fair? Should we define it by for let's say stage one PM, stage two PM, stage three? I would st stay with the uh, percentages. So our pediatric textbooks or Harriet Lane's or they all have normative ranges, and I would tell you stay with the percentage. It's going to give you percentage better cushion, better position than the count. Than the count, because so the count of five may mean nothing for a child who is two, but a count of five could mean six, something twenty-five. So, I would say go by percentage, and you're yeah. going to be on safer ground. Yeah. So my apologies for Indianizing your, uh, you know, ex to help our children. So not at all. Really Don't the power for us. Children are children. I'm. Uh -huh. I don't. They're just as important. Regardless of their zip code. Uh, one continue. Other questions. Yeah. So discussed. the question what Victor Germon was asking was the steroids on DMD, nucinesin yeah. on SMA, are they effective to postpone or improve the response? So the first part, the steroids in Duchenne, we actually just published that paper last year um, in pediatric pulmonology, where I corroborated data of steroid treated with a. Cohort from with Brigitte Faroux in France of steroid naive patients. What we've shown is that the rates of decline are parallel, but the height at which steroid treated patients start from is much higher than the um, steroid naive patients. So when you start your from a much higher function, you are going to take much longer to get to a critical lung volume or vital capacity. The second thing is. Um, the, so steroids are not a cure; they only postpone, and that too, I would say that ranges. Certainly, it's about three years in terms of the postponement, but they allow children to reach higher peaks of lung function. 
New Sinarsan is um, when when timed right in early infancy for children, I've seen some benefit. Not say I've seen any benefit past the age of you know three or four in any of our patients. And I've been getting some CTs here and there. I'm not seeing any change in muscle mass of the chest. I'm seeing families who say, "Oh, now he can do this." They're seeing that as quality of life, but I'm. I'm sorry, but I don't see any pulmonary function improved with new synorsin. The second question is: Do you think the PFT is necessary in neuromuscular kids? As sleep study is much more sensitive in detecting the restrictive lung disease. So I think the neuromuscular in disease, pulmonary functions are important to establish a baseline and to understand where your patient is going. It is also for me. It is an indicator of when I need to study my Duchenne boys. see lung function of a certain degree at a certain age with a certain bmi i know i'm thinking sleep disorder breathing i know i will likely treat i don't do a test the results of which i'm not going about because it costs money and so i think if your index of suspicion is high you respond to that accordingly um but pulmonary functions i think are important to follow patients I will do the sleep study when I think I'm likely going to need to do another one with the pressure, and that's maybe repeated once in three to four years, maybe even later, because um, most I keep the cost in mind as well as time. I actually see another question that says routinely score central hypopneas, and I say that for patients who are who have a um, neuromuscular disease, yes, we do score them. this is unique to that particular pathology and that's why i say the diagnosis or the interpretation of sleep studies needs to be in the context of the underlying diagnosis okay. the with increasing use of sma drugs what is your experience with respect to respiratory function and getting off niv in those who are on nusinersen versus resiplan versus jolgenma so resiplan is just starting over here nusinersen has not Shown me anybody who could come off ventilator support right away. Um, I don't have anybody who has started on it and come off ventilator support. No. We do know that SMA gets worse over time. Could be the second, the third decade, twelve, three. So therefore, I think these medications may see better benefit there because these patients remain relatively well. Because the study which I was there in Australia when they started, the endpoint was the death of the child. That's what when they, yeah. Uh, I, so now it from SMA one, it has come to SMA two and three. So what do you think? Is it uh, basically it's a? I again, I think it depends on when you start your treatment, what age. If you start a drug after there is significant thoracic deformity, this kid is going to come off ventilator support. It's not happening. So if someone has bad form, they're never going to have good function. So, a difficult using an IV in kids and tracheostomized patients. You know, it's all style specific, and what your goals are, and what your goals for the what the goals of the family are. If the family, you know, there is this is an issue of ethics, right? There's no right or wrong decision here. Our first, our first goal should be never to do harm, just to the child, but also to the family and the impact on the other children. and a lot depends on what expertise is available to the families as well that's why you know what happens in bombay could be very different from what happens in you know sikkim or in assam or even in europe for that matter i've been to areas of eastern europe where i feel like bombay is state of the art compared to some of those areas so not every treatment is the right in every situation and i think it's more about personal style and comfort with handling and all of that and the family's ability to deal with it so are there any procedures or hints of early diagnosis in infants or neonates for your nm neuromuscular disorders that's a really good question and so i pay a lot of attention to mechanics of breathing the respiratory paradox the phase delay the saturation instability a baseline blood gas just to look at patient 
the ability to feed. If a child is not able to feed appropriately, um, I would say we definitely need to get a sleep study to understand how pathologic upper airway muscle tone is. And sometimes even to know whether a video swallow can help you ascertain the act of swallowing that normal or not is really important. Because if you have a child who can't swallow, cannot handle oral secretions, you can't put somebody like that on face mask. They will aspirate their saliva and it'll, it'll just be a downward spiral. So the pathology can, will need to dictate your plan of action. It's certainly the underlying diagnosis. So we have seen using your ETCO2 and TCCO2 in your PSGs. Undated to use both or? So I showed you an epoch where the end title was not reliable, but the transcutaneous was, and we use both. Uh, I would say if you ever have a neuromuscular patient, yes, my recommendation is absolutely should have capnometry. At least end title, if not transcutaneous. If you had to pick one transcutaneous, if you can do both, even better. But if you have to pick one, get the transcutaneous. Because the Australia people use only transcutaneous. I haven't seen yeah. uh, yeah. it. Costly to purchase for a transcutaneous. Yeah, but you, you know, the probes can be cleaned, can be reused, and you know, end titles, you have to discard those. So that's a regard. I feel end title, transcutaneous is a little better. Doesn't require that degree of recalibration that end titles sometimes need. So, is there any role of early exercises in the early childhood which plays in any important role in your improvement in the lung function? So, that's really a good question. And I have always been a proponent of um, maximizing chest wall excursion. And I do show families some manual maneuvers. Our physical therapist also does those. I try more on diaphragmatic breathing so that um, there is greater degree of thoracic excursion. Um, sometimes I use an ambu bag and a mask just to give them deep breaths, just in order to keep the compliance of the chest wall uh, healthy. Now, th does the music and Vedic chanting help in this? I don't know, but I take a very practical approach. If I'm asking somebody to do something manually, they're only going to be limited by the strength. Correct. So telling them to sing louder or longer is only going to exhaust them, it's going to frustrate them. And so I think if you're going to do passive exercise, it's going to be better in ambu bag because that is going to give you an immediate benefit. It's going to immediately improve lung compliance. And that we know from previous studies can be sustained for up to four hours, three, three hours after even you know two minutes of therapy. Because one of the physician told me that if you chant, your oropharyngeal muscles will improve. That they, they'll get toned up. I don't know. So, so if you have intact normal muscle strength, yes, because okay. we do know that aerobic exercises and running, all of that has improved upper airway tone of normal individuals to reduce the likelihood of sleep apnea. So that has been well studied. So to your point, singing the chanting, that constant low tone, it requires very good coordination of the upper airway muscles. Airway. Yeah. That's not going to hurt at all. Apart from your non-invasive intermittent posture pressure ventilation, what are the other methods available to delay the progression of muscle weakness? And what is the place of breathing exercise? So I think we talked about breathing exercise. Yes. I, I'm not going to, I don't, if, if a disease is progressive, you can only exhaust it that much. Um, because, uh, you know, early breathing, passive breathing exercises helps reduce the inertia of the chest wall. And that is really where they burn calories. So there is help. There's some benefit in doing that. Um, other than non-invasive post pressure ventilation, any other methods for the delay of the progress? I don't think so. Uh, one way of positive pressure ventilation includes nasal mask as well as what we call SIP ventilation. And I don't know, Pavan, if you had seen some of my patients with the SIP ventilator when you had yes, come. I see, yes, I saw. So I think that um, 
when you come to a point where you are offering your patient ventilator support, you you are pretty much at that end of the road. So, do you follow the FE one of less than thirty percent parameter parameter in case of NFD to start a BiPAP or wait till we do a PSG? No, start earlier. None of my patients have ever started BiPAP at thirty percent. At thirty percent, they've almost always been fully symptomatic, and so I've I've never gone waited that far. Has the pandemic changed the attitude towards the acceptance of home cardiorespiratory polygraphies in the place of hospital-based uh, no. PSG in children? No. And, um, just as an, for the record, home polysomnography is not yet approved for patients with medical complexities like neuromuscular diseases. But in so, general... Now, Omi Narayana... Uh, a uh, sleep specialist and a pulmonologist from UK. As a, would you give a tracheostomy to a child with SMA 1 for a long term ventilation? 30. You see, that's it. I would say it's dependent on the goals of the family and how affected the child is. If you're planning on doing and you want the child to come off ventilatory support, and there is a severe amount of thoracic, dis, you know, anticipated thoracic dystrophy because of the dyskinesia of the thorax, I would be inclined to offer a tracheostomy ventilator knowing that with treatment early enough, especially if it's a newborn, they may hit a point where they may not need support in the day, but we will only need it at night. But that's again only possible if you have a good chest, chest wall shape. I can say is really hard to get with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Part of it is also that with long-term non-invasive support, these are craniofacial issues, and that itself increases upper airway resistance. It makes it hard for them. Oh, uh, it's uh, my question which I wanted to ask. Set on recommend and a vertical thing. So what is your offering on your spinal deformity correction surgeries? Where does, is there any role of your corrective surgeries at an earlier stage to make them straight in your uh, wheelchair or anything which helps you in the better uh, development of the muscle or anything? No. I think the positioning is important for and to make sure that people are not going to get into trouble. Um, so having the right positioning for the, in within the chair, the side supports is important straight. Um, it is a possibility that it may help to some extent, but I think it's more comfort that gets better. Um, I think the issue, because I've seen supine patients develop scoliosis, so I, I can't say that gravity plays havoc all the time, but I'm sure it, it does impact. Sir, I, I, I get a me question. Is, is sudden infant death syndrome a, an area of neuromuscular area or is it neurological? So that's a really good question. Current in data, so that was one of my initial research projects 20 years ago when I did that. But I think I'm asking uh, SIDS. 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 So by definition, SIDS is a diagnosis you would give only if you have no other underlying known um, diagnoses because it's unexpected. So if you have an underlying neuromuscular diagnosis, it's not SIDS. Correct. It's probably respiratory failure or cardiorespiratory failure that occurred. But SIDS by itself, uh, SIDS, they discuss this as multifactorial in origin. And most of this really, um, is seems to be around related delayed hypoxic and hypercapnic responses at the brainstem level. Right. It's, called, it's a phenomenon of what we call auto-resuscitation in that normal mechanism is broken as is mostly insensitivity insensitivity of the receptors to the drives yes. probably yes Pavan, continue please sir, yeah. all questions have been answered sir it, it's actually okay. wonderful uh, feast for us and we want to continue for longer but uh, but you know the attendance uh, to, my know, clinic has started you are drinking <laughs> and you know your energy is energizing your uh, Palatine muscles. 
sir. <laughs> so we should not cause you, sir. Not a problem. Uh, sir, please uh, send us send send uh, to my email article. Sure. So that everybody would read, and okay. we would again invite you for respicon. Again, I'm I'm saying, Pawan, I know we will invite you again for respicon in December. So please uh, spare your uh, a few minutes for us. and uh, we will have some real uh, mouth watering session at that time sir we will request you uh, something about physiology uh, in mind is physiology of breathing you know which could be very useful for um, normal physiology which will be very useful for many of our pediatricians because they need to analyze more and i regret to tell you sir many of the times you must be recollecting your undergraduate days we hardly teach basic sciences properly but only when they go to post graduation and super space they start looking i don't think you were sleep i don't recollect for being well studied in our mbbs days as well i mean no I, i would i agree with you because i think 20 years 30 years ago still very new to the field new to the let alone so, pediatrics so somewhere i think sir after knowing all the applications you should come back and teach teach here the basics for us i'm i'm going comments while i see uh the applications are done by handful of people in india but majority of them if they understand physiology i think they will recognize and refer appropriately is a uh, concluding words so uh, pavan can with your permission can we conclude yes sir yes sir i should thank emant for uh, giving yeah, yeah. us so, that's what it's sir thank you very much i would request uh, whoever is in the chat box please type thank you thanks a lot for our dr hemant for spending so much of time energy the smile and the which you have taught us and and it was very lucid and i never knew that you can use a piece of paper for a diaphragm and a syringe for the chest wall and that will be that you will see in my next module sir thanks for the copyrights to us so no cool nice so Hello, nice. there were uh, pay, uh, participants from uk as well as uh, sri lanka So it was, and yeah, yeah. So I know because I've seen you talking of physiology when I was there uh, to the patients because you had a combined clinic with the neurologist, cardiologist. When you see a DMD kids, it's an uh, excellent thing. Which and I, I had a fantastic experience with you at that time. So thank you, Raman, for accepting, and we look forward to you as many sessions as possible if you can. Sure, sure. Thank you, Happy to have been able to do this. so much for hosting um us over here it was a wonderful it's it's just as wonderful for me and i appreciate the opportunity yeah yeah thank you very much sir it in pleasure for us to watch everything all of you um please be well be safe and take care <laughs> of yourselves because if you don't take care of yourselves you can't take care of other people so nice of you and for the viewers please continue to watch respinars you will have wonderful uh, dinner time on every monday the week begins with academics so thank you thank you, thank you pawan for bringing uh, our dr hemant now he is our hemant <laughs> he was your hemant now is our <laughs> hemant i'm sorry sir for uh, for being so, you know talking to you so close happy to share share so thank we will meet you. again and again and thank you for uh, thank you victor kadam and uh, dr gauri shankar many many of you uh dr antony teres was there i i i was trying to invite her but I, i mean it was difficult for me so maybe my apologies if everybody couldn't get an opportunity see you again next monday on uh, next keep watching the activities of the chapter whenever we post in whatsapp group please forward it to all so that there will be maximum attendance and thank you very much good night good night uh, clearnet because they have been wonderful sponsors sir they have been